welcome everyone on this new episode of Let's Talk. I'm super happy to be here today with Boyan Angelov. Boyan, how are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Just after a long holiday, so very fresh for this. And I'm about to leave uh, this Friday on vacations and I'm really looking forward to it. That being said, I'm super happy to have you on the podcast today. Um, I have many questions, <laughs> more than we have time for. But uh, first of all, maybe could you introduce a bit yourself for the people who might not know you yet? Sure. Yeah, my name is Boan, as you said. I'm originally from Bulgaria. I have, have lived in Germany for quite a long time now. Came to study in Germany and stayed uh, for my life, you know, so that's uh, a long time ago. I was a scientist, so I actually studied biochemistry. So you might wonder how, how I ended up uh, where I am right now, because actually I studied uh, uh, biological science and biochemistry because I didn't like math back then, uh, which is, looks a bit ironic if you're in the field of data and AI. Uh, but I wanted to do science, right? So for me, that was the, the choice to avoid uh, doing a math, but still be a scientist. Uh, but funnily enough, when I did my master, that was more a bit in the bioinformatics field. Uh, this is when I really uh, discovered my passion for data and everything after this is like uh, my whole career in data science. Uh, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, and I think uh, data is like uh, it's such an interesting topic right now. So I hope I can provide some advice. Awesome! Uh, it's super funny that you mentioned that you didn't quite really like math at the beginning, um, and so so the audience, so to, for the people who are listening, uh, we have a, a wide range of uh, people. We have people at the beginning of the career, but people who are pretty advanced. Um, but this is something we'll we'll definitely talk about also. Uh, maybe so. You mentioned how like a, a very quick overview of um, of uh, what what you've been doing, where you where you started, and I would love to to go through your career kind of. But before that, could you share us what you're trying to achieve today in the field? Okay, so at this stage of my career, I think the most important thing for me is really to uh, provide some lessons learned. I think. Because, I mean, after this time, I think I have a few things to say. And I really, for me, the most important thing is to demystify uh, what I do. Because sometimes people think, you know, this guy uh, writes books, you know, he has been a CTO, does all of those things. But to be honest, this is not as hard as it sounds. So I hope uh, the listeners today will see that this path actually, I mean, if you work hard enough and if you see, uh, if you're motivated by what you do, I think anybody can achieve uh, those things. So that would be a really good goal to demystify a bit my um, my career and maybe to be interesting for some people because, as I said, uh, I had a bit of a weird path uh, going through biology, then bioinformatics and data science, then data strategy, CTO, and back to uh, this and also write books. So maybe somebody can see themselves in this and think maybe I can write a book as well. Um, if this guy can do it, maybe I can do it as well. So this would be a really good goal for me to achieve here today. That sounds great. Well, speaking of careers, maybe you can um, share with us a bit of a retrospective of what your career looked uh, how look like, and uh, maybe if you can also emphasize perhaps uh, the math, yeah, uh, <laughs> math part where because so you so just to mention you're the author of Elements of Data Strategy and uh, also um, published uh, by O'Reilly Python and Air for the Modern Data Scientist, which is um, I mean, I would assume there is a math behind it, uh, so uh, I'm keen to learn more about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, like many people's careers, they actually look uh, quite uh, quite accidental. You know, you think that somebody sits down and they look at their career into the future and they make a perfect plan and then it happens. Uh, and it looks like this sometimes. You look at my LinkedIn or my CV or whatever, you think this guy really planned everything. And this is really not the case. A lot of those things were just like complete accidents, right? So specifically the math. And uh, uh, this, this thing happened when I was a scientist, right? So uh, when I was the Max Planck Institute for my master, uh, we were doing a lot of work in the lab, right? Microscopes, you know, pipettes, chemistry, you know, really working a lot with your hands even. But then I had like a, a supervisor during that time who was who said you know I, I have this uh, research group we are a bit more focused on statistics and computers and I was thinking well maybe this is something for me to try I really didn't think much beyond this and uh, uh, he, he taught me a lot uh, his name is Alban Ramet so if he's listening to this podcast a big thanks for him 
but he took me under his wing. He showed me how to code uh, basically in R that, at the time. And I just loved it immediately. We were analyzing metagenomic data and I felt so powerful. You know, this is the first thing that you uh, feel probably as uh, uh, when you start writing code is you feel like there's millions of things you can do now. And I'll just never forget that time and completely accidentally became a data scientist, I would say. I mean, back then we didn't have this title, uh, so I was wondering a bit what to do after that. But fortunately, uh, startups, uh, they were not very picky in terms of your background. So basically the idea is, can you do data science? Let's hire you. Uh, so that, that happened to me. Uh, and I'm very grateful for this because the title data science didn't, didn't really uh, exist back then that much in Germany. Uh, so I accidentally became a data scientist at the beginning, even if I didn't like math, which is funny, uh, but I loved coding, right? And I get this question all the time back then, do you need math to write good code? And I mean, my answer is you do need to know the basics, of course, to add things up. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's about solving problems. And I hope our conversation today will show that you have all kinds of people in data. Yeah, I was one of those guys who are a bit more focused on the conceptual part of data science about business solving, uh, solving of business problems, right? I was never the best uh, developer. Uh, I think I was pretty good at knowing different technologies. Um, but I was never like, for example, if you give me this typical Google question, invert a binary tree, right? This algorithm, you know, I, in C++, uh, it will be challenging for me even to this day. So like this, I kind of managed to avoid the math while still being useful. Um, so I did data science for quite a few years, uh, became also senior data scientist, uh, mostly startups. And then the second accident in my career happened when I ended up in consulting, in management consulting. Again, uh, I always saw myself as a bit as an introverted person. So um, also it, it's a bit weird to go into consulting if you're introverted, but I just, I just decided to do it. Why not? You have to try it. And I absolutely love it, right? That's somehow the career where I really found myself in consulting. And I feel like that was a time when I really could um, fulfill my potential, right? To take all of my skills, all of my background. I spent several years there. Uh, that was uh, in the, you know, the fancy title at the time, data strategist. Um, I love, and that's where I learned most of the things from my second book. Uh, and I finished the, the first book at that time as well. Um, after this, I became a CTO. So I did a data strategy for one organization and they, they took me as a CTO, which was, uh, you know, in Bulgaria, we used to say, you have to eat the soup you cook. Basically you do the data strategy and then they call you, you know, that sounds good, but now you have to implement this, you know? So now I'm very careful when, <laughs> when I do data strategy, because who knows, maybe you have to be the one to uh, implement this. And I learned a lot from that role as a CTO. It's a very, uh, of course, uh, challenging experience. I was also pretty young uh, to do this. And uh, uh, after this, I decided now is the time to, I, have, I felt I haven't finished business in consulting. So I, I, this is the time I finished my second book, Elements of Data Strategy. And I thought, you know, I, I think I still have some stuff to do in consulting and I came back to consulting where I'm right now again leading data strategy at Exeta. Uh, and funnily enough, I'm also a CTO because I'm a CTO of one of the portfolio companies. So I kind of can combine uh, those both worlds and maybe this can be a topic uh, for today. It's a real, this is a very important, impressive path. And, um, and uh, I have many questions um, that we could go for and it is uh, super uh, interesting. Well, do you think coding have helped you um, reconciliate yourself with mathematics in a way? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I actually love mathematics now. I mean, uh, I ended up like getting, uh, learning calculus in those days. So I really came a full circle, right? But it's not easy, I would say. I mean, the jump is not uh, so obvious. I mean, I still, a lot of the things I understand conceptually, Right. I mean, the inner details of whatever gradient descent and everything. I mean, sometimes, uh, I mean, I can't implement everything from scratch, but still, I think I have this uh, conceptual appreciation of this. Right. Uh, and on the same level, uh, understanding technology in the role of a CTO and a data strategist. I mean, I have coded all kinds of things. I have done uh, even front end development, mobile development in my free time. So I was never really, really deep in any of those topics, but I have a very broad understanding and I know in general how things work together. So I think as a CTO specifically, that helped me quite a lot. Awesome. 
Awesome. That gives uh, that might gives hope to someone who is uh, starting in the field who doesn't really like uh, mathematics. And um, there are many different ways to do things. Um, before we get back onto all this uh, amazing journey that you've uh, been on, I would love to ask about your two books that you've uh, published. So the one on data strategy and the one for data scientists with Python and Air. Um, so I think my question first would be. Um, what made you wrote this book and like what inspired you wrote these books and how one complement each other we have one where we talk about python and air for data science uh, modern data science and we have uh, uh, the other one who is which is about data strategy and if we look back at your career you started uh, coding in air at the very beginning when you were in the lab and then further on in your career after roles of data scientists and senior data scientists when you switch to um, to CTO, you, you went for you went to consulting, um, and, and so you have this very interesting um, int interesting vision of the field uh, still today, where you you act as a, a consultant and a CTO. So, how would you frame um, just that? How the two books complement each other, and and what you've put into the two books. It's a good question. I mean, the first thing I'm going to say is there are different types of writers. Um, I mean, most. Of, I mean, sometimes I am one of those writers which is so inspired and then just writes a lot. And it's like in the movies, you know, you see this person sitting there, like in uh, somewhere in France, uh, drinking wine and writing a memoir. And sometimes I'm that guy, but very rarely. Normally, I'm the person who uh, struggles uh, in writing, procrastinates, and then somehow gets it done. Because writing is extremely difficult. Um, it's a very challenging thing to, to write a book, I would say. So the motivating factor has to be very big. Uh, so you can't start writing a book if you're really not motivated. And for me, I heard somebody say the pain of uh, not doing it is bigger than the pain of doing it. I had the same feeling for those two books because for Python and R, which is the first book with O'Reilly, and first of all, um, they made it very easy, O'Reilly. Uh, I'm a big. I was always a big fan of them. They have the best books in, in you know, in computer science in general uh, and topics around it. They made the process very easy for me as a first-time writer, to be honest. Uh, but still, uh, I had the feeling about those two languages that I have something to say that nobody else will say, right? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, you know, people were always talking about Python versus R, what's the best tool for data science and AI. And I hated this conversation. It's such an impractical conversation. You, you hear. It's, Till, till this day, you know, should you use SageMaker? Should you use something else? Uh, there is a best tool for the job. And me knowing R and Python, again, I started with R, then I went into Python as a data scientist. I appreciate knowing both. So it just teaches you a new way to think, like, you know, two languages, for example. It makes you much more creative and gives you so many more tools, so much more open source. So R is more focused on statistics and visualization. Python more focused on machine learning data engineering so knowing both was amazing and i felt somebody has to say it in the book i make exactly that case you did you do need to know both right it's not one versus the other one you can somehow better at some stuff the others for other stuff right and i had the feeling somebody needs to say it, so uh, i think in that book i provided the answer for that uh, the second book was uh, motivated a bit differently because it's uh, obviously a non-technical book uh, I mean, technical people also is very useful for them, but there's no code in the second book. Uh, this is when I became in my first uh, uh, consulting role. I, I got the title data strategist and then you, nobody tells you what to do. Uh, you know, like it was now you have the title and your job is basically to make sure the data projects work. So this is really the job requirement in a way. And then you think, well, that sounds great, but what do I need to do for this? Do I need to be nice, listen a lot? Sure, typical consulting stuff, but I didn't have any tools. Uh, and that frustrated me quite a lot. I mean, what I, I, I looked for books on a data strategy. There were a few, but uh, quite old and old fashioned. Uh, I didn't find any, any great uh, books, which really immediately I could do something with them. So I decided, you know, at that time I was just learning. I didn't think I'm going to write a book, but I had to learn everything on my own, how to do data strategy. I mean, I had really great uh, colleagues, which are much more experienced than I was, who supported me quite a lot. With them, so many discussions, they explained to me what is a current state analysis, you know, what is a gap analysis, you know, what is a, a digital maturity assessment, 
all of those terms, they, they helped me and I learned them with clients. Eventually, I started to read other books on strategy, uh, for example, Technology Strategy Patterns, which is probably the best book for a CTO. Uh, that one had a lot of tools, nothing to do with data and AI, but the tools were there. Um, and eventually, it could be a good data strategist. And I started to think uh, at the end of this, when I became a CTO, well, you know, now I learned this myself, and I'm sure there's other people who have the same problems like me. So somebody has to say, uh, what, are, what is the way to do data strategy? And I never, it, is, it was a bit arrogant if you think some, some guy does data strategy for a few years then wants to write a book on this. And this is the first thing which I wrote in the first pages of the book. You know, I'm not saying this is the only way to do data strategy, but here are those 15 components, you know, and rough phases of data strategy that you can take as a starting point as a data strategist and then learn, you know, in your specific company, specific country, you do data strategy in a different way. So I was feeling, you know, somebody has to write that book too. And I thought I can do it. Uh, and I did. So the difference is the second book is self-published. So that was another, uh, I decided not to go with the publisher. I had some offers, but uh, I just wanted to get it done the way I wanted the book to be written and to, to see how that works. And that brings other challenges to be honest, more operational. How do you do that? Uh, but that was uh, extremely rewarding to write the second book. Uh, it's a bit, mm, there's a lot of uh, weird things I have put in the book. That's the, the perks of being self-published. And I wrote the book in the way I wanted to write it. So that was, gave me a lot of satisfaction. And I do think those two books, uh, they, they have different audiences, but uh, I would really recommend people to have a look uh, into them, especially in data strategy. Uh, I hope there'll be more, much more books which build upon those things, which will be better probably. Hmm. Awesome. Super interesting. I have a, I have a quick question before uh, uh, I ask you more about specific parts that you mentioned and specific specific parts, sorry, of your career. Um, how do you see? You've been a CTO. You've been building strategies, implementing them. You've been trying a lot of tools. Um, by tools, I mean different programming languages, different uh, front end, back end, etc. Uh, and I personally, I'm really into learning these, uh, let's say, hard skills and be, be fast learning them, which I think is a very great advantage and fast at implementing them also, even like when those are new concepts uh, that we're trying to implement. I'm thinking, for example, right now of data mesh um, and how do you implement it in specific uh, architectures. But before, before all of that, uh, I always like to step back and because this is all technology and technology updates very fast. So my question to you right now is, how do you see that technology serves us and why is it so important to have a data strategy and these technical skills yeah. and adapt through time? It's a very interesting point and I'll give it from my perspective. When I started out, I always saw this really older older people right in my field and i look at them i was thinking you guys have no clue right you guys are we have the new cool things here and you are just you know complete dinosaurs you know why are we even working together I had this very arrogant view. it's kind of around the second third fourth years of your experience you get this feeling you know uh, now i'm one of those guys in, in a way and <laughs> i was looking at those people and i was angry and they they of course they didn't know the coolest new stuff right now we talk about rust for for machine learning you know we have fancy stuff uh and uh i look at those people of course they didn't know the, the cutting edge stuff but they had something which i never could understand somehow you put this person in a, in a situation and everything works out uh everything gets built and everything gets done and you can't, I couldn't explain how that works. The dinosaurs, they came and they fixed the stuff. Now I understand it because this is so much more important than any technology. Is um, uh, This is really the only thing you get from experience is intuition, how you work with technologies, right? At this stage of my career, I can look at a new topic like exactly Rust for, for machine learning, you know? And I can get, I understand the principles, you know, I don't need to take, uh, read five or 10 books about it, understand the basic principles and understand how this fits in the whole ecosystem, right? But uh, you have the most important thing is uh, called system design, how do you architect systems? 
how do you work with people and how do you do processes and how do you get business value, which is, of course, the most important thing. And those things, uh, just experience you can take. This is nothing you can really learn from a book. Um, and the technical skills are just one part of this, to be honest. The, uh, the technical skills are probably the easiest to acquire and the quickest one to disappear, right? I mean, this is why you should never get married to a technology because you remember people at my time, they like Hadoop. Nobody talks about this <laughs> anymore. You know, you don't have any data engineers who do Java right now. Uh, people don't hear about this. So this is dangerous. Uh, learn to solve problems and learn many different languages. You should embrace the new stuff. And about learning, I mean, this generation of people has like the access to generative AI. And I mean, uh, I sometimes meet people who are skeptical about this, but try to try to use it for a new language. You see, you can learn so much. In my time, I had to read, get a giant book from a library uh, to, to read on a language. And now you can just interactively learn anything. So I think this generation is super powered. The cloud is also there. So technical skills are much easier to obtain, uh, but what becomes harder is how do you think in systems and how do you get experience in the things around it, you know? So this is why I think strategy is very important uh, because I have always this definition of data strategy, which is basically, this is everything around data science and engineering, which is not uh, coding. Uh, you could say that managing a team is data strategy. You could say that uh, selecting use cases is data strategy, right? And the skills required for this, they're very different. Uh, and as I mentioned, the skills that are most important ones are communication, system design, systems thinking, and then you have the technical skills. Uh, and the communication one, of course, I'm pretty sure many of your guests will tell you about this, uh, but being able to write, that's another perk of writing books and why I advise people to, to try to write. It uh, teaches you how to think and express ideas. And I'm not a native uh, speaker, so it actually it's, it's a very challenging thing to, to write in a different language, uh, but it really teaches you to speak and communicate. So I think um, those other skills are much more important even, yeah. Hmm. Deep skills, uh, skills that require, requires time and, uh, and uh, deep, uh, deep focus on yeah. what are the most valuable. But things. maybe uh, before we continue, because you said it requires time and uh, there is different types of, uh, you know, you hear about deliberate practice, you know, some people are, you, you can take two people, one person has 15 years of experience and the one three. And you might think, well, obviously the person in 15 years of experience is better, you know, this is really not true because maybe in those 15 years, this person just did the same thing all over again, you know. So I would say any skill, you really have to push yourself very far, you know, mm -hmm. this is called deliberate practice on purpose. You put yourself in situations uh, which are really hard on the point of breaking, right? I mean, when if, if you are a data scientist, you know, when you get the opportunity, uh, somebody tells you, you know, lead the team and you should say yes, you know, because this is exactly how you push yourself. You don't wait till the time uh, you'll be ready because that doesn't happen that way. You always have to push uh, beyond what you do. Hmm. That's awesome. And I like how you phrase that. That a strategy is not a, a technical skill itself. It's more of a, a framework and decision making process, which requires to um, draw what technical things will be done and how we will achieve to achieve a business goal or anything. And uh, it is uh, an interesting way uh, with my own words, <laughs> trying to paraphrase. Um, but that's super interesting. Thanks for, uh, for sharing, uh, for sharing your vision on that. I will definitely re listen to it <laughs> uh, <laughs> after this recording. Um, so that's fascinating. And, and I think what I would like to ask now that we were discussing about technical and non-technical skills, um, how do you manage to balance both technical and non-technical? And, uh, you also mentioned that someone have 15 years of career and can be not as valuable as someone of three years. So how do you approach this deep work that makes you great understanding the principles and not the technology itself? So those are yeah. kind of two questions, the technical, non-technical, and how to go into the deep work. This is a good question. You know, the first one I would say, uh, I just don't think about that balance. At the beginning I did because when I became a manager, uh, this is the first thing when first time managers think, well, now I'm just, I'm not coding anymore. I 
I'm going to become irrelevant for the industry, right? Because you become successful based on your technical skills, but then suddenly you do something else and you think, well, now these people learn new things I have no idea about. Um, so I, I, I had this fear too, myself, of course, uh, several times it goes away. Uh, but eventually I just stopped caring about uh, thinking uh, about balance between technical and non-technical skills. I always just focus on, does this make sense for a business? Uh, do I deliver value, which is uh, obvious to a business? Uh, and that's the only way to look at this because, you know, there'll be situations in your career, you had some kind of a company and you might be very useful in something which is non-technical. Maybe you have a great personality and this is going to prevent a whole data team from falling apart because they have a nice person who kind of uh, puts everybody together and you really are a million times more valuable to the business instead of deploying a new model, right? And in other situations, deploying that model, maybe you're the only person who understands that technical stack, right? You can't find anybody who understands the specific stack and then you become very valuable. So this balance, I just stopped thinking about this. I always really thought, does it make sense to the bottom line of the business. And I always upset people when I ask them, what is your value to the business? Can you measure this? Because our work in data is very uh, enabling focused uh, because normally let's say you create some kind of a chair model for uh, uh, to support the marketing team, but the marketing team often will get all the credit, you know, in some ways because the money goes from them. You know, so it's a bit like uh, we all work in this enabling field and it's hard to know what value do we contribute. That's why you have a lot of questions about, you know, does this data science team need to exist in the company even, you know? You always need to justify ourselves. Uh, so early on in my career, I just started to think about uh, what do I do that makes sense? And you'll be surprised to see in organizations that I have seen, it's like so many people do brilliant things which are pointless which is the worst type of data science mistake. You do amazing work, amazing models, but then nobody cares. It's not used. It's the worst type of thing you can do. So basically just always try to trace your contribution to some kind of uh, uh, metric, which is real. Uh, on the second part is a bit of a, how do you uh, do the deep work? And this is, there's so many great books on this, on, on uh, managing yourself. I mean, in the last several years, I've been doing the second brain stuff, of course, like many people do uh trying to uh, organize myself in a different way um there's so many methods i've tried them all i've tried podomoro pomodoro techniques right how do you work 80 20 uh mit methods just get done frameworks i've tried everything in the last uh, 14 years but i remember my my father once uh, i was explaining to him what i do and he was, he's also a cto so uh in a completely different field though and he, I explained to him, yeah, look at this. I have this fancy method now. I have my et cetera cast and second brain. I have this and that and that. And he looks at me and he said, you know, if it's really important, you just do it. Uh, and uh, every time once I start to over-optimize uh, my life, I really think about this. You know, if it's really important, you're going to find a way to do it, whatever it is. Uh, you find a way to find the time for deep work or whatever. If you don't, it's not that important. So you really should question your motivation, I think. Uh, so really, I think, but I do still use the second brain in all of those methods, of course. That's awesome. Do you think, for example, I can see a specific risk for people at the beginning of their career who are technical, because um, if you have some specific social skills, let's say you can be good at managing a team or you can be great at sales. And I'm not talking about the sales guy who is going to like sell something in a old way that doesn't serve the people who is buying, but like the sales guy who is genuinely good and making a good thing selling because um, the leads are great, etc. So we have this pass and even in terms of uh, money uh, in, in like, money making we, we we can see like advantages of going on this path and so the risks that i can see see and i would like to your your, your vision on this is some technical people who are very talented but who have other skills will not spend the time requires to kind of master the principles the basic technical skills because they would like to jump to the next steps too fast uh, but then they end up a bit uh, in a tricky situation in terms of, of a career perspective. So 
Um, could you share maybe a bit on that? Great question. And this is very true. I have seen it myself. Um, the, I remember listening to one piece of advice a long time ago. I don't remember who said this, but basically you can't have more than two big skill sets. And I think that's the way to go for this, right? I always knew I'm a good process person and I'm a good technical systems person, right? Like, uh, and you should pick two skills, uh, skill sets, I would say, because those are kind of like more combined. For example, let's say you are good at managing people and you're good at one, one other thing, which is coding, let's say. Don't do more than this, I think, uh, because this is the danger, what you say, a bit to be the jack of all trades too early. I mean, when you're older, when you kind of become an expert, then it's much easier to jump around to other things. Uh, but at the beginning, I think we should just pick two things, and but make sure they are valuable somehow. Uh, for example, if I I'm a great uh, coder and I can play guitar very well, um, I mean, I mean the, the, the other is a very good skill set. You know, I could have a successful career as a musician, maybe, right? But they don't amplify themselves. Those two, right? I mean, me being a successful musician, maybe. It would contribute to my uh, coding career somehow, but probably not. Well, if I'm very good at managing people and I'm very good at writing code, those amplify themselves. Yeah, so you kind of become a very rare person if you're very if you're kind of a uh, world class at those two things. I mean, being uh, like in the top 15% in two things makes you world class immediately, right? This may be what I'm trying to say. You don't want to be. Uh, Maybe it's very hard to be the world-class person in, in like whatever programming language, a top 1%, uh, but it's easy to take two and be one of the 20 people who combine those two, right? Uh, but you really have to think. And also, obviously, obviously, at the end of the day, they, these have to be things that you love doing, right? I mean, I always mm -hmm. liked what I do. I always loved my career. Uh, the, the daily job, you have to enjoy it, you know? Right. Right. Um... Right, I was thinking, but then I think we can we can discuss about uh, decision making regarding careers. This can be very interesting. I would like to ask you about a specific data project, um, if that sounds uh, fine with you. Whether it is uh, as a CTO or where you implement it, for example, you mentioned that you designed the data strategy and then you implemented it. Maybe this or another project, but can you share a bit your the framework you went for to approach these challenges, both in the strategy part and then in the implementation part. It can be high level or it can be a bit more technical on some part, but like what you feel is valuable in this approach, in this process, I think it could be very valuable to all of us uh, to learn a bit from your, um, from your vision and your decision making. Yeah. So I think what you mentioned is a good example uh, because this is the data strategy which I designed and then had to become a CTO to implement. This, I think, is my favorite example because I messed up, you know, and I always take, <laughs> I always uh, like to provide negative examples because you learn much more from them than, you know, I went there and it was the best data strategy of all time and it was all rainbows and unicorns. So I like that example because uh, this is the biggest learning I, I had in general in data strategy and strategy in general. Uh, you can't have a static data strategy. So I did everything by the book, right? You look at the company, you look where things are, uh, you interview people, uh, you look at the data, you look at the architecture, you look at the current use cases, you brainstorm about future use cases, you look at data access, you look at data governance, you look at how the data people and the developers are set. Uh, you look at the budgets, you look at the roadmaps, you look at the requirements or for new use cases. So it's a lot of data strategy work you can do. Uh, you do all of this. It takes anything between uh, two weeks and you know five months to design a data strategy, depending on the organization and scope. I did this by the book. Uh, and then it came the time to implement this. It immediately broke. Uh, because I made a very dangerous assumption there, which I'll never forget, right? Basically, we um, that business had two types of data. One is uh, uh, going to be bought by a vendor, a data set, and the other one would be scraped. And I made a data strategy, and those two data sets, they were the foundation of all the products of the business, which the business said. It was a SaaS business, so everything was based on those two data sets. All the models, all the interfaces, everything was based on those two data sets. But the 
the both data set, I made a data strategy assuming that data set we will use when I'm a CTO. Well, the data set wasn't enough, right? So we had to use to scrape the data. And uh, uh, <laughs> because you can imagine the difference between data you buy, that you pay several thousand euros, much more sometimes, uh, and you get a clean, perfect data set where even better you get an API, right? That you can query, you get perfectly formatted data with a perfect schema, with documentation, with support, all of this, yeah? And then you can build your nice uh, uh, stuff around this, which is a piece of cake. This is the data strategy I designed because I was thinking, yeah, it's going to take us like whatever, two weeks to take this data, then it's going to be several weeks to build some models and visualizations, easy peasy. But then the scraping, um, the scraping data set will be, should te theoretically be the same schema. It should be theoretically almost the same. But <laughs> of course it's not. Schema is broken. You have to make scraper architecture, which also you have people, you do need to hire people who understand scrapers. You have to deal with how do you go around scraping. I mean, anybody who is in data knows how, how painful scraping is. Um, you need, uh, this is a combination between data quality issues, data pipeline issues, and most importantly, skill set issues. I just didn't have the people to do it. And then, you know, if you don't get this upstream uh, mistake, then everything else uh, doesn't work. It didn't matter, right? So my fancy use cases and all of this was pointless because we, we got stuck at the beginning. You know, I just didn't have the people. Then you can imagine you have to hire people. Where do you find them? It takes three months. It becomes very operationally problematic. And that taught me something which I wrote in my book. I call it the influence cascade which is basically uh, now when I do strategy, I always spend a long time before starting to work, which basically I spend a long time looking at the data, very long time looking at systems, like very disproportionately long time. Uh, because before this data strategy was like, you come, you interview five people and you make a strategy. Uh, and this was the mistake, right? You have to understand the systems uh, first really deeply. And this is very difficult because it costs a lot of money. And the companies don't see any benefit of this. They say, why we will pay those people now to do data strategy? All they do is they look at code. There's nothing, there's no productivity to the business. It doesn't seem like you're working because you're just going around with the microscope and uh, getting documentation, right? And this is a hard sell because this is not two week project, it's months, right? Maybe two months to look at all the data, ensure the quality. But this has changed everything in the way I do data strategy, this painful experience. Now I always like, uh, that's also the approach in the book, is the due diligence phase is very long and is the most important one. If you know the stuff, it's very easy to make a data strategy which is successful after that. Uh, and that's the hardest uh, lesson I would say that uh, I learned. Oh, that's, uh, that's very interesting. I like how, I like how, it's clear that one need to learn how to explain to business that I'll not be doing use cases and provide tons of money yet because it will save costs in the future, this deep work that I need to do at the beginning, which is also why it seems like it's recommended for a company who wants to enhance data strategy or AI strategy to get the strategy and get it implemented by the same person. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. And I uh, think also at the beginning, you do need to do this, uh, not just the due diligence, but also how do you, because you know what happens in big companies, the pilot projects, you know, it looks very uh, exciting. You know, you get some, some data scientists, they build something very quick, they make a demo and everybody's mm -hmm. excited. But you know mm -hmm. yourself, I'm sure in, in, in companies, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg, you know, who is going to deploy this stuff? Yes. So, and then it becomes really, that's the quick win, but middle term, you're going to die, basically. Your data team and your career is going to suffer because you quickly going to raise the expectations very high with your pilot projects, but midterm people will be asking, uh, well, where is the stuff? Why isn't it deployed? I thought it's done. And this comes in the due diligence and design phase. You have to think about architecture deployment. How do you measure these things, you know? Hmm. So I'm very much against pilot projects, but you, they have a place uh, in companies, but you have to be very careful, I would say. Right. Yes. And it, it seems like um, it is very... Uh, um, I really like this uh, manage expectations. Uh, and I feel like it's... Uh, 
in consulting it applies i mean i think it applies in in in, in all kind of jobs but like being able to manage well expectations is a uh, key skills because like you said i can do a very quick pilot but before it is in production adding value to the business uh it might take more than that because i do it in three hours in my in my google notebook there is no problem with that but now so that it runs on your data on your real-time data and your real-time data on your systems um with whatever complication that maps involves and i'm always impressed how how much complications that i didn't think of can appear and you're like whoa okay how do we deal with that okay that's going to take me for five more five more days <laughs> so um, that's uh that's very very interesting um so so we've discussed about exactly that technical non-technical manage ex expectation uh, and uh, and i like uh, how, how you how you phrased it um and today you do both you do consulting but you're also doing a cto um i'd like to ask you about your your experience um for example if uh, if i'm a technical um Uh, you mentioned about use cases and pilots, pilot projects. And you mentioned about how people do brilliant jobs which have zero business value, which is kind of, uh, let's say, useless, even though it's brilliant. Um, how deep should technical people think about what they're achieving and what they'll be achieving in the future? How would you share about that? So the way you started this question is very interesting because you mentioned CTO and I always make the contrast between being a CTO and being a chief data officer or chief data and AI officer, right? Hmm. Because now I'm a CTO, but I also do consulting. Uh, and these are rarely you, one person does both at the same time, right? I mean, consulting, you know, you have different projects, it happens, but it, these are very different things you need to do. As a CTO, your role normally is that things are on... Uh, things are boring in some way, right? Everything is stable, everything moves, nothing breaks, security is tight, people are happy, budgets are within scope. That's your job. As a, and that is a very risk-averse mentality when you're a CTO, I think. Um, to be a chief data and AI officer, for example, uh, or to be a lead data strategist or whatever else, you do need a different mentality, which is very uh, riskful. You have to think about pilot projects. You have to think about uh, breaking things fast, right? So it's a very different mentality in the way you work, I think. So I don't think the uh, same person can do those two jobs at the same time. I think you have to see uh, which one. I mean, I do like both, to be honest. I think it is possible. Uh, but as a CTO, you have to really focus on your goals as a CTO. But if you're a chief data and AI officer, you need to be much more... Uh, focused on risk, I think. Um, and uh, balancing those two, um, I think uh, it is it is challenging because you do need to, uh, it's the way you communicate as well, right? Uh, if you are, if you want to be more on the innovative side, you really need to focus more. You need to be much more focused on what's on the market now. You need a lot of uh, qualities, which are sales qualities. You need to inspire people quite fast. Uh, you need to be confident and good in communicating, right? I mean, these are also skills as a CTO, but you're always a bit, the, the incentives are a bit different, I would say. And it, this doesn't just go for the CTO, CDO difference, but for example, the difference between of, uh, head of data engineering and head of AI. It's exactly the same. Your head of uh, data engineering Uh, their job is to be very, everything works, yeah? It's it's purely an enabling function, not that much innovation in many cases, yeah? You make a data platform, perhaps. Mm -hmm. You're head of AI, you expect this person to be very focused on, on advanced use case, advanced analytics, right? And these people often fight, I think, because they have different incentives. But hopefully you have a good uh, company culture. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I think. Yeah, kind of. But I'm also asking myself, uh, because in the end, what we want is uh, the the business or, or the, the the use case or whatever we're trying to achieve to you know, to to improve, to reduce costs, to have a bigger impact. 
Um, and it's funny because um, I think a chief data officer um, and a CTO, and I understand the, the distinction, and maybe they're here to balance one, one another, but um, it, it's also, I'm thinking if the CTO, um, like how can they align? Maybe this is my next question, let's say, how do you how do you implement a challenging data strategy? And for example, if you're a CTO, how do you make the CTO comes along? And yeah, the main question is, I'm a CTO, I'm a CTO, and I've I okay, I have this new or evolved vision that I want to implement to the company, um, which needs which requires a, more investments or more capital than one would expect. Like the CTO would like to give me X, X amounts and I'm asking double because I want to do this and this use cases and this use cases. So, so how, do you, how do you approach this kind of uh, situation in which there is, um, there is one who wants to pull a lot and one who wants who have like risk aversion, like you mentioned? There are two things, and this is an excellent question. The first thing is those we uh, we always say culture is strategy for breakfast. Yeah, we always pretend we're technical people. We're very like focused on numbers, and like the CDO is gonna bring an Excel file with the with the potential revenue, and the CTO is gonna bring an Excel file with the potential cost, and then they will sit together. This is not the case. All of many of those decisions are made on personal like trust and reputation and really the culture of the company. It's much more important to have a real good personal relationship and trust and work together as a team because, again, the, when the incentives are different, you're always going to have conflict. Uh, and conflict, the only way to deal with this is to have a good culture uh, and good accountability, I would say. So there is no other answer to that part. The second part is the art of compromise. And it's a bit related to culture because you do want to have people who are pragmatic, you know. Even if you're if you, on that level, chief data and AI officer, even the head of data and AI, I think, and above, those roles, you still have to be pragmatic. You can't just be the visionary, right? You still have to have some level of pragmatism. You can't say, I need uh, 50 data scientists or uh, ML engineers with 15 years of experience in TensorFlow. Uh, you have to understand how much those people cost you need to be able to uh, appreciate the technical depth that you need uh, and you need to be able to justify this to some extent. You know, this is also like, how do you measure value from data and AI? It doesn't need to be super quantitative, right? It could be qualitative, but you do need to justify not just to the CTO, but to your CEO and CFO and everybody else. You, You need to justify why you need this budget. And then you can do a compromise and uh, not everybody has a personality to do a good compromise. You know, sometimes you can negotiate and then uh, you will win the argument, but you lose the relationship. And if everybody is prepared to compromise, for example, the CTO says, yeah, we can do it, but I can't give you these resources. You have to take those. Uh, We need to choose this technology versus that one. You have to be able to adjust yourself. Also, the CTO has to take some risk, right? The CTO has to agree, well, let's do it a little bit. Um, so I think, yeah, c- culture is strategy for breakfast on that level, I think. We shouldn't pretend we are masters of process and strategy, but we're just people at the end. Right. Right. And and I think you said something very interesting, which is, uh, even though, I mean, if we look at the costs, it's also like, okay, you want to implement this, but to do this, we need to recruit someone who have those specific two main skills which through time the value of the use case doesn't compensate the talents required to maintain this technology and push it yeah. further um that's super interesting thanks for sharing um thanks for sharing this uh, uh very great insights um I have many questions to go from here, to be honest. Um, my mind is a bit uh, exploding right now. I think what I can um, ask you about because of uh, your expertise and, and, and uh, the lot of examples you have been able to see through your career is 
what are the most common mistakes you can see companies make uh, when developing data strategies yeah. and how you would avoid them today? Um, number one mistake is not having a data strategy. So <laughs> I think <laughs> I would change even the question a little bit because not every company thinks they need a data strategy. They think um, we can just hire, I have seen this with big budgets. They think we can just hire 20 data scientists and that we tell them do uh, AI for optimizing their warehouses. And then they you know, wonder six months later why nothing happens. We have to hire consultants to do that. So not having a, a data strategies, uh, a data and AI strategy is the number one mistake. So basically not thinking before doing. And those things, they cost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and I would split a bit like because we're, we're in Europe. I think the mistakes that are made in Europe and the US sometimes are a bit different. Uh, you see a lot of uh, so-called cargo coating, which basically means you think that you can be like Google, right? But you're in a, uh, your, your company culture is very traditional in some way or you have a traditional type of analog product. Uh, you fail to realize that you're a different company. And this is a shame because the traditional businesses which want to do data and AI, which actually arguably the largest economic value in Europe lies in those companies. Uh, there's so much value in mid-sized to large-sized companies in, in Europe that can be generated with uh, uh, data and AI, which just lays around. But instead of playing to their strengths, which is really good uh, culture, really good domain knowledge, they try to copy Google, uh, other companies, you know, try to uh, uh, copy their ways of working, which don't work. So they should play to their strengths, I think. Uh, they need to take advantage of the great domain knowledge and leverage a bit the technologies a bit better. You don't need to build your own cloud, you know, you can, you can just pay for it, right? Uh, this is this is one uh, issue. And of course, the culture of innovation risk taking, uh, sometimes it is lacking. Uh, and of course, the talent is still very short. I mean, people say that we have a hiring crisis and everything, but I still think uh, people who are very pragmatic about data and AI, they're very rare. It's not just enough to take people with PhDs. Some, you do need the people with PhDs quite often, but you do need more generalist type of people who are uh, more closer to the business, perhaps. And with the new tooling, you can take a data analyst and teach them to do certain things. You can take a data engineer to teach them a certain thing. You can transition from data science to data engineering. So I do hope companies realize that the people that work for them, they're not static machines. They can change. And this is, can be uh, very beneficial for a company. Hmm. Yeah, and it comes back to culture again. Culture is... Uh... Well, maybe you could uh, share how would you go about understanding what culture fits your environment and your personality? I think what I have seen is always the culture of an organization is uh, a mirror of the top leadership always, for good or worse, right? The way the top leadership communicates, this always propagates down. And as a CTO, I saw this firsthand, right? The way I behave, uh, it was very scary for me to see that certainly it goes down through the organization and people start to behave in the same way, right? If I'm very aggressive in certain things, then people become the same. So the culture starts uh, with good examples, I would say. Uh, you should always try to lead by example. Um, and good culture, I think, I mean, to be honest, you can't also make a perfect company as well. Like you can't have like, uh, these are the five great cultural traits and the whole every european country should have those five cultural traits it's not the truth we have different cultures in europe different cultures in the same company you can't build the perfect company for everybody some com companies are of course going to be more aggressive for example you know the story with uber how at the beginning they had a different ceo who had to be very aggressive with the taxi lobby in the u.s and then he he uh he left, right? He was fired because he wasn't good enough for the next stage of the company. So you do need different people at different stages and these are not static things. So you have to decide what kind of, in your environment, what type of culture do you need? In some industries, for example, if you do AI in healthcare, you do not want very innovative people sometimes there, right? Maybe you do want the risk averse people, right? You do want the slow methodical people in that organization. So I'm very careful to talk about culture because every company is different, but every company should define it for themselves, I would say. Right, right. 
looking around them and not what Google or Facebook are doing, but who are my clients? What are we doing? Uh, what reason? What do we want to achieve and establish or develop better the, the culture? Yeah. Um, so I think we're running a bit out of time, but previously I told you I'd ask you right now um, about um, making decisions through career. So do you have any methods, any tips that you could share with us about uh, doing big decisions in, in your career? For example, transitioning from one step to another, for example, the first time you, you, you became a CTO, um, these kind of uh, moments. Uh, how do you approach this decision-making process? It's uh, also probably the first time I get this question, so let's see how I... <laughs> nobody ever asked me before this, I think. Uh, one thing which I realized is I always used to follow people and think, you know, I want to have the career of that person. Uh, and Or ask my family for advice or my friends for advice. What happened in my career, because I changed different things quite a lot, I was a scientist then, uh, you know, a data scientist and all of this. I realized people gave me terrible advice. You know, people always think, even people who really care about you, they'll give you really bad advice. You know, your parents will tell you, become a doctor, become a software engineer, whatever, you know, like, <laughs> which sounds great, but it, it's not you. Uh, so I very quickly learned because I became at least moderately successful in some of those decisions. Some of them were good. And then I look back and I almost wanted to ask those people, why did you tell me not to do it, right? Because I, I often early in my career, people told me, don't do this, you know, you need this. And they were very often wrong. And now at this point, and even in the last five or six years, uh, I realized that you're just completely alone with this. You're absolutely alone with your career. It's just you and your career. It's not even your closest family knows about your situation. And this is scary because nobody can give you advice. But it's also liberating because it's just you deciding what you want. Uh, and this can only come from yourself what you want to do. Uh, so I would say do not follow any uh, advice which is very specific. You become, after maybe in the first years of experience, I meet very junior people. They all are kind of the same, especially when they're young. But slowly you become very weird very quickly. You have very strange requirements. As I said, maybe you do like guitar and you can combine somehow your love for guitar and software. Who knows? And you should just embrace that part uh, and just trust you yourself only on those big decisions. You know, unless you have obviously family requirements, you do need to consult uh, on the big decisions. But honestly, just trust yourself what you want to do and kind of ignore everybody else uh, because you're the only one who knows, I think. That's awesome. I love this answer. And uh, even though it might disappoint some people who are expecting to have a their future kind of uh, helps with their decision making. I feel like it's um, totally spot on in terms of, um, and I think it's risky to take advice from people because if you're disappointed with the decision you take because of someone, then you're not in control of your life and you can't blame anyone to, yeah. for the decision you're taking. So. <laughs> So... There's situations, perhaps maybe I can add to this. There's always situations when you are working in something which is very specific. Let's say if, uh, I mean, you want to be a data strategist and you talk to me when I became a data strategist. You know, we are not far away from each other then. And then I could give you good advice, right? Because you really, because right now the things have changed, you know, it's much harder to give that type of advice. And maybe sometimes you have these isolated career decisions where somebody who you trust can help you. But you should never take advice of people who uh, don't live the life you want to live, especially morally, right? So uh, I'll be very careful, but it's you, you should have a good mentor. And I had a few, so I was very lucky with this. Uh, so, um, yeah, don't un un underappreciate that as well. That's awesome. And finding good mentors based on what I want for myself. So I need to first figure it out and then find the best mentors or people who are aligned with the vision I want for myself so that they can help me achieve it uh, in a better way. Does that exactly. sound great to you? Exactly. And my first mentor was my first CTO and he's still to this day, we're close friends and he's still my uh, mentor in many ways. But it's a personal relationship. It's not about knowledge transfer. This person really knows what I 
uh, now I'm also CTO, right? Uh, twice. And this person really knows how, what they want to do from life. And you notice this, right? Yeah. So it's not just about uh, what he never just talked to me about what it takes to be a CTO, but he just gave me the belief that I could do it. Um, so yeah, but those people are very rare to find sometimes. Hmm. Uh, awesome. That could be uh, the, the subject of another episode, how to find uh, uh, the mentors that suits me. Um, thanks a lot for your time. I have three little questions at the end of this episode, but before asking you these uh, short questions, I want to thank you a lot for coming on the show, Boyan. It has been a pleasure to have you, to learn from you. Uh, I think we've shared a ton of value, so feel free to send us messages um, and questions that you might have uh, for the episodes. Um, the first question is, um, where can people find you and send you these messages or learn more about you? I try to keep my up website up to date. So absolutely everything I've ever done is probably there, which is just uh, boyanangelov.com. So I think that's the easiest way. And of course, LinkedIn, you can uh, just uh, reach out to me there. I put everything there. Awesome. Um, and um, my last question is, uh, would you have a message uh, for the Let's Talk AI community? Um, and it can be personal, it can be professional, um, it can be for people at the, at the middle of their career with 15 plus six years of experience. It can be like, a, would you have a specific message that you can yeah. leave us mm -hmm. with? Now, after this conversation, uh, especially the last several things which we talk about, I think I do have a good message there. Um, and I, I mean, don't forget, I am still a technical person. I do not like like new age uh, mumbo jumbo or like really motivating things. But it, I think it's very important to just be true to what you want to do and do not compare yourself with other people. So I do hope everybody uh, listening can, you know, just look at themselves and just uh, go for what they want to do even if people around them don't agree with that, or it seems very crazy to do, right? If it feels like it's too, not how you should do your career. So I think in terms of your career, maybe your life, uh, I'm not that arrogant to say that I have a solution for life, but for me, it always works just to follow my own uh, instincts and what I, I would like to do. So I hope your listeners also think a little bit about this. Awesome. Thanks again for everything. And I wish you to have a wonderful day. Thank you, Thomas.